Mm-hmm. All right. So on this episode, I have uh, drummer Russell Hayward III. Russell is well-known drummer in the Baltimore arts and music scene. Some of his uh, past projects has been with the band Puddle, Mangog, and uh, Later Than Soon. Is that correct, Russell, the, the last band? Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, Later Than Soon is, is an open-ended thing, and I'm actually currently with Mangog. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah, I did Puddle for about four years, give or take a, a day or three either way. Um, I'm still with Mangog now, and Later Than Soon is kind of a one-off thing now. Oh, okay. Both the guitarist and I are still in town, and the bassist is doing his own things, but when he pops up, we try to do like one-off shows. So Later Than Soon is technically still together. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start at the beginning. When, when did you start playing drums? At what age? And I know your dad is a drummer. What what musical values do you think that your dad passed on to you as a drummer, like to, to sculpt you or to mold you into the drummer that you are today? Well, uh, well I know right, that's a broad question. question. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a very broad question, but you know me, I have many answers to the same question. Exactly. Now, um, I started tapping. I started tapping around about, <laughs> I started tapping around about age two. Right. Well, actually I was like play, playing like actual beats at age two. And then I started playing full on at age four. And basically when it comes to the dad, again, he's been a music teacher and a musician and a drummer for about, and a percussionist, I might add, for about 50, 60 years. So basically wow. what happened was, did he was teach at, uh... his tagging along. Did he, he teach at Douglas? Lessons. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Did, did he teach at Douglas? Uh, no, he taught at Harlem Park Middle, and he taught out in Anne Arundel County for about 11 years. Okay. And uh, he taught in Baltimore City for about, I'd say, at least 20 plus years. Okay. okay. So, um, basically, what would happen was he'd have school band rehearsal. I'd go with him. He'd have band rehearsals with the bands he was in. I would go with him. He taught drum lessons. I would go with him. And basically, I just started absorbing all of this. And it's like, he, I mean, we sat down and taught me a few things here and there. He doesn't like to take credit for teaching me, but I give him credit for teaching me because he was teaching other people and I was paying attention. Mm -hmm. So it was just like all these things I I watched him do for years. And it's like, okay, this goes here, that goes there, dip, 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 dip. And the pieces just started to fall together naturally. And so as I got older, it was one of those things where, you know, I still paid attention. So and I mean, he taught me about, you know, diversity. He taught me about musicality. He taught me about discipline. I mean, there are things that, you know, that you, that I learned from him years ago that I still use. And awesome. it was just one of those things where, and I talk to him about that all the time. It's just like, there are guys that go to college to get the education I got for free. Exactly. You know, watching right. him work, watching him fix problems how to run a rehearsal, how to, you know, just how to, to be a leader. And it's just like, yo, this is ridiculous. Right. And I still reference that stuff and the stuff that I'm doing both in cover playing and original playing. So it's like, yeah, all right. And it's funny because I remember one time he called me up. I was living in Georgia at the time. This was about, I want to say 2009, 2010. And he's like, well, I have a question for you. I'm like, all right, so I'm, I'm writing this piece out for my students and I'm wondering what, you know, what to do with this particular part. And Mike, when I tell you I almost dropped my phone, I'm just like, wait, what? It's like, stay on, hello, right? Because mm-hmm. I never expected him to ask me a question like that. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been in the game for longer than I've been breathing. And for him to ask me a question, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it was like, and he was like, I said, so here's the thing I said, you want to challenge them, but you don't want to alienate them. That's the thing. You have to find that gray area between them quitting because they're frustrated and them being challenged enough to want to work at work on something. Mm-hmm. And, and I gave him an answer and he was like, yeah, that's how, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, yeah, but that's the thing about he and I, but a lot of stuff is we think alike. And like, for example, I was a ringer for him. I don't know. I got back in 2012. We're talking about maybe 2013. And I was playing, he asked me to play the song. He's like, look, this is what I need from you. I need upbeats on the cowbell. I need two, four of the snare drum and one and three on the bass drum. I'm like, done. And that's all he had to say. Cause he knew, I'm like, mm, eh, mm. Right. that's all it is. It's like, we have this, this, this understanding about those kinds of things. 
But it was so many different things. And actually, the mentality that I got from him is what led me into Mangai. Well, actually, there's two reasons I ended up in Mangai, actually. One of them was to get a chance to play with the guy from Later and Soon and the bassist. <laughs> And the vocalist in and Mangog actually was in a group I was in back in wow twenty years ago. This is crazy. A group called um, Final Answer. And Mangog, and Mangog, Mangog is kind of like a sludge doom uh, project, correct? Like metal yes. doom. Yes. 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 And that was one of the things was I had gotten to the point about maybe actually when I got back to Maryland, I decided to like stretch my boundaries. I decided to get out of my comfort zone. I wanted to be uncomfortable because I wanted to, I wanted growth, basically, to make a short story shorter. I wanted to be able to do things that I hadn't done before. And I got the offer to join Mangog, and it was like a no-brainer for me because, for one, I love the guys involved. Mm -hmm. Two, the material was something that I had never done in large quantity. And three, it gave me a chance to, to get, get out of my comfort zone. And so mm -hmm. the thing that was interesting about that was um, – I started basically mimicking the things that I had heard from other people. And the guitarist is like, that's fine. He said, but honestly, I want you to be Russell. I want, I, I asked you to do this because I want you to, to basically, you know, throw your hat into the ring, do the things that you do within this, this landscape. And I'm like, Oh yeah. So it was like basically finding, you know, taking some of that and adding me to it. Mm -hmm. and it's really it's really refreshing to to jam with these guys both live and, and in, in the studio because it's just like the chemistry is ridiculous awesome. and then on top of that we're brothers so it's just like those things are just so like, like fulfilling for me and it was just like you know once I started adding my own two cents to the stuff that they were are had already written and then the stuff that we have written together it was like oh okay Again, it just it just was like, bam, you know. So, so that that's really a lot of fun. Are you? you know, um, I, I have this other thing. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but my next question was like, uh, are you still involved in on uh, drum core or teaching drums, or are you not doing the drum uh, core I thing anymore? Here and there, I do. I don't haven't really done anything in large quantity. I do little bits and pieces of things with people when they ask me questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably going to, what I've been trying to do when I get time now is to start doing video series of things. Cause I've been coming up with these little, little vignettes of stuff that I use for myself that I think work for other people. And one of them, for example, is a thing I call found in translation mm. where I take something from say a rock, a rock genre, and then basically find a way to or have it connect to something else. Or there's like, there's there's like three guys that do the same thing and I figured out why it works versus I figured out why it works in that particular style for example uh I was listening to a Deep Purple song on Machine Head years ago and Roger Glover talked about how there's not many guys playing a straight beat over like a, a swing beat and I heard it I'm like okay but then immediately two things popped in my head one of them was smoking in the boys room Motley right. Cruz version. Yeah. Tommy Lee's doing the same thing. And mm -hmm. then I also thought about David Lee Roth's version of Tobacco Road. Greg Bissonette, same thing. And I actually got to, the funny, the best part about that, or the most, one of the most fulfilling things I've actually done is I got to jam with Greg Bissonette on Tobacco Road, which was wow. just, yeah, because he did a clinic at Bill's about six, seven years ago, give or take. And he was actually having people from the audience come up and play with him. And that kind of threw me for a loop when I first heard it. And then, so well, just to clarify, stuff, uh, just to clarify, you're talking about Bill's Music House in uh, Catonsville, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And right. so, I, you know, I answered a bunch of his questions because he was answer, asking trivia questions, and you know, I was being Russell and basically answering a lot of them. And um, <laughs> so, after you know the qu questions were done, he and I raised my hand. I said, "Can I jam with you?" He's like, "Sure." He's like, "What do you want to play?" I'm like, "Tobacco Road." He's like, "Count it off." I'm like, "Okay." And so, you know, after it was over, he's like, "Man, you remember that better night?" I'm like, "Stop it, quit it, no us, but hey, Uncle." And I took a bunch of pictures with him, and my dad took some pictures with him. But the thing, back to the the whole found in translation thing, it's like, okay, this is why this works because of what's going on with the way the music feels. 
And so <clears throat> there was that, and there were other things that I figured out, like the concept of like real fast jazz is very similar to upbeat gospel, what they call a, a shout. Because mm -hmm. it's like the tape that you're going to be using the same technique because of the tempo. And it's like, okay, this is why this, again, found in translation. So there's stuff like that that I want to be, I want to start talking about. And I talk about, I want to talk about my influences and why I play th certain things a certain way. And nice. my dad was a huge influence on me again, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, it was funny because he never gave me, he never said, okay, you have to listen to this. You have to listen to you have to listen to that. And it was easy, it was crazy because his collection was everywhere, it was all over the place. I mean, he had Zeppelin and Bad Company in his collection. He had to leave with Matt. Yeah, I remember being at your house. I'm a, I remember being at your house and you showing me his collection. Yeah, he, he has a, a lot of cool yeah, stuff. And it's just yeah. like there were no rules. It was just like it, it, it was, that was one of the things that affected me because, like, okay, well, if I can take from, you know, John Bonham, I can take from, you know, from, you know, take you forward from P Funk and just throw it in the same gumbo and, and roll with it. Mm -hmm. so, so it was just like, and I use that with, lo with all, lots of different styles of music that I play. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to be able to do different things is because my dad said to me in point blank terms, he said, if you want to work, you have to be diverse. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to play more than one thing and play it well. And it was interesting. I got, I'm going to reference him again because I played a country gig about, Mm, seven eight years ago and i was sweating bullets i'm like what the hell am i going to do with this and i'm like Wait a minute. i can do what i already do which is play music and i went back and told my dad that i said but that's the thing you know I, I think that you know that I, I i'm trying to tell you is that because of the way you play you can play just about anything because it translates there's that t word again translation mm. it's like if you can do this you can play just about anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically what varies at that point is the way it feels and the tempos that you're playing it at and the styles of music that you're playing with it. But if you can play that with conviction and keep time with it, dude, there's so many things you can do with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like if you listen to Prince, you listen to, you know, Prince did a lot with that. You know, a lot of people would do different stuff with that. It's just like, okay. But yeah. again, it's about how fast or slow it is and how you make it fit musically. And that was something else I had to learn how to do was So you you have to develop a musical you have to develop a musical palette. Right. Well, that was the other thing that I figured out was and and one of my friends said something interesting, got him Craig Austin, who's an awesome musician. He plays like 10, 12 instruments. He said, I had to develop a skill set that nobody had. And I was just like, bing. And he literally said this recently, but I got it because I was trying to do that too. And it was interesting because one of my other Yoda figures is a guy named Nick Costa. And I got to, I, I used to hang out with him and pick his brain. And one night I did a jam session down 347, which was on Calvert Street. And I played behind a guy who's playing some blues stuff. And I, excuse me, I played musically. And so I got up and he said, you didn't try to do too much. You played the gig. And I'm like, wait, what? And then I thought about it in depth. It's like, ah, I said, that means three things. And I had that, I said that to my dad once. I said, when Nick Costa said to me, play the gig, he meant three things. Again, broad. We talked about that a minute ago. He said, basically, he didn't say this. It just, it clicked in my head. I said, number one, know the idiom and music that you're playing. Number two, learn how to play it musically. And number three, the elephant in the room, most important part out of all three of those, play it musically. And I'm like, okay, all right. And that was, those, those are watershed moments that I got with people, you know, and listening to different parts of different, different like concepts and just analysis and, just playing. And that was one of the things, again, I keep bringing up my dad because pretty much this, he's the reason why I'm a musician. He would put me in sink or swim situations. Well, it's, hey, it's like, go. That's like, how you learn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just like, 
you get, you know, I said, you, you only, you, he used to say to me, you only get better by playing. And of course that sounds downright ask, what sorry, asinine. But if you think about it, you can't sit, get better by just imagining what you're doing. You have to actually mm. do that. And that's how I got on the job training. And it was just one of those things where in order for you to grow, you have to want to be, you have to want to stretch your boundaries. You have to want to move beyond where you are. It's like, and that's something that I've been using. Uh, there's a, a phrase that I've been using for about, I'd say seven or eight years now. And it actually came to me in the most like outrageously, it, I won't say outrageous. It just made complete sense to me because it was, it was what it was. So I got up one morning and I'm like, okay, I'm hungry, but I have to get up to go eat. I'm like, that's it. Hunger dictates movement. Right. And I, that's like, that's like one of my, that's my, my business slogan for lack of a better term. And the reason why I say that it's like, okay, you know, I, and I broke it down into parts. It's like, select a goal, formulate a plan, put the plan in motion, accomplish the goal. Right. And then the thing about it is, okay, so take for instance, you get to that point. Do you want to progress past that point or do you want to, are you want to maintain the goal that you've achieved? Yeah, that's exactly see, not, to, that is, not to cut you off, but that's exactly yeah. kind of what I'm doing here. I'm, you know, kind of interviewing, you know, producers and guitar players and bass players that I've known over the years. But eventually I want to be able to hit up Vernon Reed and have a conversation or Jimmy Hazel and have a conversation. Nice. But I want to develop like that confidence, right. you know what I'm saying? Which is why I'm talking to people like you, you know what I mean? But like moving on, I'm sorry, Russell. Uh, like what what are, what are some of your favorite venues to play like over the years? Like what are your notable well, favorite venues? Well, it was funny you mentioned that because I literally was talking about uh, this place up in New York that I played for the first time earlier this year called Gussie's. Mm -hmm. um, I like it because I, I it was very akin to the old 8x10. The 8x10, the old 8x10 well, the old 8x10. had a basement vibe. It, it, was, it was a hole in the wall. It, it, was, it was a hole in the wall, but it was something about that vibe you got with the bad sight lines yeah. and the acoustics. I love that place. spot on the stage. I saw Deftones at the old 8x10. I saw Deftones there. It was a madhouse. Yeah, I saw, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a whole nother. The first time I actually went there, I was 18. Because I went to see uh, Steve Smith's group, Vital Information. Mm -hmm. And um, it was crazy because I started running into people. I mean, of course, there were a bunch of people that were there. But I never got to see the whole, understand the vibe of it until I started playing there. I loved playing the 8x10. Uh, the vault was fun. Right. Um, I was lucky enough to play the record about three times. In Townsend. Um, one of which actually I opened for Kelly Bell, which cool. was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So it was just one of those things where, you know, you, those are the rooms that I like to play in Baltimore, like the, those rooms. Um, uh, there's a couple places. There's a place up in, in uh, York called Fat Daddy's that's actually pretty cool. Um, Hal Daddy's was interesting for me because I never understood the whole the basement vibe of it. But again, the eight by ten thing where it's basically a basement with a stage, but it's just like yeah, yeah. It's you, that you up, feel it's the that vibe up of the people, close. You feel the vibe of the room. Right. It's that up close and personal feel. You you never played at the uh, Rams Head in, in Annapolis. Uh. I played the Rams Head uh, Roadhouse, but I didn't play the big room. Gotcha. Um, because I did the there's like the side stage there that does like covers and other stuff. I played there, um, mm -hmm. but I've never been like I've never played either either one, the, the one in downtown or the one in Annapolis. Um, I actually got to noodle around on the stage at Annapolis once. That was interesting because or not Annapolis, but uh, Baltimore because I think they had done a James Brown show there or something, mm -hmm. and there were some drum sets on stage. And I asked one of my bosses, "You might play a little bit." He's like, "No, go ahead." So I was like, "Yeah, da, 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 da. did the Russell for about five minutes." Like, that's cool. I'm like, thank you. Cool. And well, the thing was interesting. I, I tell people when they meet me from other other parts of the world, and then they hear me play, I'm like, "That's what I really do." This waiting tables thing, this hosting thing <laughs> is cute, but it's it ends to a means. It's like your parents always say, "Baby has something to hold back on in case your hopes and dreams don't work out." 
waiting tables and hosting and being a cashier are my something to fall back on. Right, 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 right. But yeah, man, I used to love eight by ten was just amazing, man. I, I, I just, I mean, yeah. there was something about that drum riser and looking out over the room and seeing people and yeah. just the vibe we got on stage because we were all like there. Mm. It was like, yeah. Um, I also got to play those like the, the one of the more interesting places I got to play was Ocean Ocean City Convention Center. Oh, because there was a skateboard convention down there about 2003 ish. I want to say 2003, 2004. And uh, I went down because we went down and, and uh, Puddle went down and played this convention. It was like, oh, OK. And it was crazy. because That's arguably one of the biggest stages I've ever been on. Nice. And it was just like, yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. This is what this feels like. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, that was a lot right. of fun, too. So, like, me and you, we, we share a great love for Living Color. Uh, tell me some of your favorite color tracks and, like, maybe any side projects, like, with Vinx or uh, Doug Wimbush, personal, you know, side uh, solo oh, stuff. Okay. Like, let's um, just talk about a couple favorite, briefly, you know, tra uh, Living Color <laughs> tracks and Good albums, answer, you know. <laughs> All right, well. Here's how I'll break that down. I'll go like first four albums and I'll give you like two tracks per album. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, first album, uh, Desperate People and Broken Hearts. Oh, Middleman too. Second album, uh, uh, Undercover Darkness mm -hmm. and Silence of You. Yes. Uh, and with Stain, I would say, oh, I don't know how I missed this. Buy and Ignorance is Bliss. Those two are, yeah. And I'd probably, even if I had to go a third on that one, I'd probably say uh, Never Satisfied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, side projects, there was an interesting project that uh, Doug and Vernon, I mean, Doug and uh, Will were doing with most death called Black Jack Johnson that was, I remember Incredible. that. I remember that. Do you remember um, the uh, the DJ Logic. Logic project with Vernon Reed? DJ Logic. I heard. Yeah, I remember it, but I didn't get a chance to check it out. And I yeah. remember he had a thing called the Yohimbe Brothers that was pretty cool too, from what I heard. The Yohimbe Brothers. Um, yes, Yohimbe Brothers. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Right. One of the things that I remember Vernon doing, they had this thing they used to do on uh, be bet on jazz, where they would pull people from different like different jazz or fusion guys and throw them together and do charts and it was interesting one of the things i heard vernon do was um uh what the hell is that called uh red baron old billy cobb tune which was really cool but the one other thing that i want to get into or i'm, I'm going to glaze call, call this over you know who jimmy hazel is obviously jimmy yeah. hazel had this smorgasbord of sound he threw together as a tribute to a guy named jeff johnson called a song was called jungle and what he did was he brought Vernon in, he brought Jesse Johnson in, mm. he brought Lenny White to play drums, Lenny White from uh, Return of Forever and, and uh, Jamaica Boys and some other groups. Mm. Um, Rick's guitar from 24-7 uh, was on it. Right. Uh, Eddie Martinez, who's played with David Bowie, Run DMC. Um, there was a group from the 70s he was in called Mother Night that was incredible. Um, and he also was in a group with Lenny White called 29. But it, you, if you haven't heard that, dude, it's on YouTube and iTunes. It's stupefying. No, I haven't heard it. Yeah, send it over to me. Can you, um, when we definitely, get off? I'll definitely do that after I get off after we get off here. But yeah, yeah. And I actually got to talk to, to Jimmy about that a few years ago, about a year ago, because he came to Baltimore to see Living Color, and he stayed with. Uh, I don't know if you know Allison Overcheck or not. She's basically like, a, she's a real cool, cool girl. She's mm -hmm. basically a music fanatic around town. And Jimmy stayed at her house. So mm. she calls me up and says, why don't you come over for dinner? I'm like, okay. I knock on the door and Jimmy answers the door. Wow. Jimmy Hayes. Right. Yes. And so we got to talking about all the stuff that I knew because of my dad and stuff that mm. I knew he listened to and different textures about how things came to, to a different it was like oh okay you know and we spoke the same language which is why we clicked and he's an incredible guy dude he's really cool burden's really cool mm -hmm. um doug uh 
Doug Wimbish is really cool. Yeah, Will Calhoun's cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, the only one I haven't met is Corey. Mm-hmm. So, right. but yeah, I mean, color, man, living color is just always an interesting thing for me from different perspectives. Like, there was the whole cult of personality thing was just like, in high school, I'm like, um, who the fuck is this? And then a guy. Well, who um, a lot of a lot of people friend. don't. Not to cut you off. A lot of people don't know that Vernon played on um, a couple of Mick Jagger solo records too. Right. Back in the day, and that was actually how I, as did uh, Doug Wimbish, and right. um, but there was the thing he did with Ronald Shannon Jackson, and then it was funny because I I went to see Will Calhoun in clinic years ago, and I asked him a, a really sarcastically funny question. I said, uh, whatever, because he was playing a band at Berkeley called Dark Sarcasm. So I said, uh, whatever became a Dark Sarcasm and was there plans for a year? And he looked at me like, hey, he's like, Dark Sarcasm. <laughs> he's like, no, we all graduated. That's what happened. <laughs> but yeah, and then that whole thing. And then one of the, again, a friend of a friend of my dad's, or the brother of a friend of my dad's came over with the set. And I'm like, yeah, you got to put that on. Let me check that out. And um, I was like, okay, all right. So, but yeah, there's so many different levels of the of diversity there, and so many layers. Oh yeah. Of things with that, you yeah. know, and it was just like, okay, you know, and then again, getting to talk to Vernon about so many different things about the Ronald J- Shannon Jackson thing and the different, right. you know, textures that he's been do things that he's done, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it was just. And then you get in the album track, it's like the hits were great, but then you get in the album track with them again. Dude, we could, you and I could talk about that for like about. Oh, yeah. Hours. You know, stuff like Solace of You and all those great tracks, yeah. man. You know. So moving yeah. on to another great group that we love Fishbone. Couple yes. favorite tracks, couple favorite albums. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, I mean, I've come to realize that. that I'm going to tie some other people into that question real quick before I mm. answer that question. Go ahead. I've come to realize that there were groups like Fishbone, Primus, the Chili Pe- and the Chili Pepper specifically. Those three groups had like a four album window that was just ridiculous. Right. So, I mean, for example, with the Chili Peppers, you had Freaky Styling, mm. Up with Mofo Party Plan, uh, Blood, uh, Blood Sugar, and Not in Order, obviously, and Mother's Milk. Primus, you had Fries. She had the first four releases. Mm-hmm. Same thing with um and with Fishbone. You had that window between Truth and Soul and the reality of my surroundings. That is just ugh. so I'm gonna start again. I'm gonna do the same thing I do with Living Color. Tracks. Um Truth and Soul. Um Mom Pa and uh what was the other one I song? I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, I'll take Freddie's Dead by Default, but there's a song that one of my friends used to have on his answer machine. I can't remember the name of it now, but great album track. Uh, I think Give a, Give a Monkey a Brain is a monumental album. That album just front to back, there's just so many ball busters on that. Yeah. I mean, if I had to pick... Again, if I'm picking favorite children, that's going to be a tough one with that one. But I'd probably easily say, um, uh, "Warmth of Your Breath," uh, "Lemon Meringue." Oh yeah. Properties of Propaganda, um, and Unyielding Conditioning. Uh, again, that's just if I had to pick. If if I could just you know. Because that album comes out swinging with swim. I can't. It's just like, it does. We're going to talk about smacking you over the face and getting your attention. And then uh, the reality of my surroundings, um, of course, uh, Sunless Saturday, mm-hmm. um, Everyday Sunshine. Uh, that's two. Um, Those are, that's, that one's got a, it's, those are, yeah, I'll go with those two. Cause there, again, there's so many, that album's just chopped with, oh, I don't know how I missed this. Fight the youth. Oh yeah. Again, they knew how to bite your head off and get your attention from the word go. It was just like, um, 
now that we got your attention, here's the rest of this album. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, those are, you know, I mean, even the other stuff that they did, well, they recently did a cover of Them Bones that was just belligerent. Oh, yeah. I, t- I posted that on my Facebook. So good, man. Yeah, so good. And and it's so cool to hear uh, my man on vocals, uh, I think Chris from Chris the old Dow? school. Chris Dow, yeah, dude. Yeah, what a great, great cover. To see them back, dude. It was just- what a great yeah. cover, man! That was that was awesome to see that. That was yeah. Go, yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of doing this thing called top four. Like, briefly, give me a couple like of your top three or four bass players and three or four drummers that kind of influence your style. Like people that you always kind of think of over the years. Like three or four bass players or three or four drummers, and it doesn't have to be jazz or hip. I mean, or metal or progressive, whatever. Right. Uh huh. Um, Michael Anthony going basses now. That's Stanley Van Halen. Clark. Michael Anthony from Van Halen. Yeah, Michael right. Anthony Van Halen. Stanley Clark. Um, mm. Mark King from Level Forty Two. Oh. Um, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, if I'm gonna say um, like also, I like um, Peter Paladino. I was just literally talking about his fretless work the other day, and I'm just like, mm, he did yeah. an album with John Mayer about a decade ago that still is is bananas. He's on a that D'Angelo. He's, he's, he's on that D'Angelo album, right? The Black Messiah. Yes, yes, really yeah. good. And really he, well, good. his his other gig, if you call this a hobby gig, his other gig was playing with the um with the Who. He played he with, the who? with the Who. Pino Palladino was touring with the Who. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, drummer wise, uh, Lenny White, again, guy I listen to in large quantity. Mm-hmm. Steve Ferrone, uh, Tony Williams. Oh my gosh, that guy. Um, and uh, Zigaboo from the Meters. His name is J- Justin Modalistic, but they call him Zig for short. Mm-hmm. From the funky dude, meters. that guy's dudes was so fat he made me late for a date. <laughs> so, I put on they, they had a double CD my dad bought it called Funkify Your Life, and I put it on and the grooves just started like I'm you know feeling it. My dad comes and knock on my door. He says your date's here. I'm like she can wait. I'm busy right now. <laughs> so literally, he made me late for a date. Wow. And the cool part about that story is I got to tell him that story about four years ago at NAMM. Oh. He, he was like, that's funny. So, yeah. but yeah. So for, for you, do you prefer session drumming like with multiple bands or you you like having like just a one consistent band to play with all the time? Or- well, see, my thing is I'm so eclectic that I my the other sides of my brain and my musicality need to be fed. Now, the other part about that is um, I also freelance because I also make money doing that. Mm-hmm. So I do fill-in stuff. I do, um, I have like a couple, like two or three cover bands that I play in because I like playing different stuff. I play with an old, I play with a group that does oldies and like 60s and 70s R&B and, and, and pop and, and, and like oldie stuff. I do another group that plays classic rock. And then it's just, I, I, I love playing so many kinds of music, but I can't just, now, if I had one group that did all that, I might, you know, just be like, all right, I'll stick with this. But the other problem is I'm a drum junkie as far as like buying drums. So mm-hmm. I, I have a bunch of drums that need to be used. So therefore I have to have a bunch of different projects to use the drums that I bought. So <laughs> yeah, I need. I need a reason to buy more equipment and a reason to play the equipment that I have. So I have other projects for that. So, mm-hmm. so you've been coming yeah. out to Cali the past couple of years for NAM for in, in, in Orange County. Yes. Uh, well, I came out the first time I came out was 2016, and then I came out again this year, and uh, because I was trying to get back for like the past couple of years, but because I was at that time I was actually playing music full time. I didn't have a day job, so mm. that was kind of. That was kind of difficult for me to do that as far as my schedule went because I would always get booked for stuff on the weekend of them or whatever. Like the first year I started doing that was 2016. So, and 
that was the first time I took that weekend off to go out to Cali because I'd never been. That was the other thing. I'd never been to Cali. Mm. I'd never been to Nam. I, you know, I needed to get out of here for a little while. And the irony to it was that was the year of the blizzard. So, and the other irony is it's snowing now. That's the other comical part about this. So, yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to try to do that as much as I can in the near future. You know, yeah. again, I get the network, get to meet people. You know, it's a great experience. Get your name out there. And that's other thing. From oh what yeah, I hear. definitely. Yeah. It's a good yeah, it experience. is. You know, and, and well, if I can get you, know, I mean, that's the thing. You got to definitely, you got to experience it for yourself. You can't. It, it's amazing. But it's Between like a special. It's, it's a special invite type of thing. You just can't just roll up in that piece. You know, you gotta either well, be depends. connected. I mean, if, connected. If, well, you have to know people. Where the thing about it is, a lot of people, a lot of companies that basically, if you're an endorser of companies, most of the time they get you in. Mm-hmm. Like, if say for instance, I know guys that there are Pearl Drums endorsers, and Pearl got them in. Mm-hmm. So if you have an endorsement, you can get in most of the time. But if you know somebody, you know, I got lucky. I know somebody, so you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. One little piece but of information yeah, you, that I get a chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to go. I really I want to go, go. I mean, every year that I'm here in L.A., people always tell me about it and I never get to go. So I really want to go to that. But one little piece of gear information. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that Zildrin was from like Armenia, like originally they are like an Eastern European company, the yeah, symbol company. Armenia and, Tur- and Turkey and then they, and Turkey, they came yeah. over here. Um, yeah. And um they started doing their own thing. And then it's funny because one of the guys that was not really one of the guys that was part of the company, um, Bill decided to break off and do his own thing. And that was how Sabian came about because Mm -hmm. basically Zildjian or Sabian is his two kids, Sally and Billy and Zildjian. So it's Sabian. That's how I came up with that. Oh. And so, yeah, they, and they, you know, they came up, they'd come over here and then, you know, uh, Armin, the old guy, basically passed it down to his kids, and uh, he passed away a while ago now. But yeah, it was, yeah. But that was, yeah. They were from Turkey, and I actually, it's funny you mentioned that because those are the symbols that I play. Oh, okay. But yeah. So yeah, the Baltimore scene are bands like Jimmy's Chicken Shack, Kelly Bell, Jawworks. Are they still around? I know Kelly Bell's still around, but oh yeah, yeah. Kelly Bell's still around. Mm-hmm. Um. Jimmy does, I mean, Jimmy does one-offs with the Shack every year. At least they were until COVID hit. They do like one or like two or three shows a year. Mm-hmm. Um, Jaw Works is still around. Um, Color and Lesson uh, does like one-offs every year. Laughing Colors, the guy, Will, Cow- well, <laughs> Will Dorsey comes back home and they do like one or two shows a year. Mm-hmm. Um, they used to do a, a, a one-off Thanksgiving or Black Friday. And uh, last year, I think they had Kelly Bell open for them. Mm. So yeah. but, um, they're still around. Guys, oh. bands like that are still around. Yeah. And they're so, about to open the record again. So that's going to be interesting. I heard they're opening record and Hammer Jacks again um, back up. That's what I heard. Yeah, Hammer Jacks is a little, is, is, <clears throat> seems to be a little slower on the, up, uh, on the uptake than the record does. The record seems to be progressing rather quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, Hammerjack seems like it's from what I've seen has been in a holding pattern for at least five or six years. <laughs> and so I don't know what's going on with that. I can't confirm or deny anything, but that's the plan from what I understand. So, so, so who are some of the uh, R and B producers yeah. that that influenced you, like M. Tume or anybody like that that influenced your style? It's it's uh, um, well, I'm gonna go. Old school, I mean, Quincy Jones, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Bill Spector, I liked his stuff. Uh, Maurice White from Earth, Wind & Fire. Um, James Carmichael, who produced both Atlantic Star and the Jackson 5. And uh, his calling card probably is the Commodores. Mm. Um, and then you get into nine or like more newer stuff for lack of a better term jam and lewis right la and babyface uh the neptunes Mm -hmm. uh teddy riley and it's funny because teddy riley's actually a a drum influence on me and i had to explain that to one of my buddies he's like wait what 
He plays drums? And like specific, no, he doesn't play drums, but he would do drum programs for mm. people like Keith Sweat. All the stuff that he would write and he would produce, he would do drum programs on. Oh, and okay. one of the things that he programmed that got my attention, or should I say that there's a piece, a, a little little snippet of, of rhythm that I borrowed from him that he used on uh, Make It Last Forever with Keith Sweat. And it's like, I found out later that it was, a, it was first of all, I found out it was an 808 drum machine. Then I found out specifically what he was using to make that sound. It was a cowbell sound. Mm -hmm. But I, what I did was I borrowed the rhythm. And like, I would play it on different, different, like different parts of the kit. And uh, one of my buddies is like, you know, that's pretty cool. And I said, well, I got that from Teddy Riley. He's like, Teddy Riley? Got named Mike Eccles. Mm -hmm. Shouts out to Mike Tony Eccles. And um, he was like, yeah. I I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a Teddy Riley thing. He was like. So, but yeah, that is that, that, those guys. And then um, that's R&B producers. Um, if you want to go hip hop producers. Well, yeah, that, well, uh, that. Yeah, that was my next question is like, what, what are some of the parallels between jazz and hip hop for you over the years? Like, we know that, you know, Premiere used a lot of, you know, jazz samples and the Gangstar stuff. And then, of course, you got your diggable planet. You read my mind when I said, I was literally about to say Premiere. I mean, even with yeah. some of the other stuff that he did with like, with Nas, with that jazz chord on uh, New York State of Mind. Because right. I remember they were talking about, they were listening to, to records together and that chord jumped up and they kind of looked at each other like, whoa. And, but it's like the, the, the thing that I, I had to learn about hip hop is the concept of, again, no rules. You know, mm -hmm. you can take a James Brown sample, you can take a, a Billy, you know, a a Billy a, Squire a, sample. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that was the thing about a lot of this stuff. It was interesting to hear them do different stuff with it. Like, for example, um, Dr. Dre used a, a silver song for funky enough and i didn't know that for years because i was um watching the unsung as my phone falls to the floor an unsung on uh the silvers and the, the youngest member of the silvers is a guy named foster and he did this song called misdemeanor and and the, the, the part that got my attention was uh it, well the way dr dre was like compton compton mm -mm. compton mm -mm. Com i was mm -mm. like that's where that came from. Like, ah, and then, so it's stuff like that where, you know, you can take old tool funk and do different things with it. You know, that was the same thing that, uh, that, that people would do with different, like cool, like that cantaloupe, you know, people took, you took cantaloupe violin and put lyrics on them. I'm like, that was genius. In you my know, opinion, with, um... you know, cool like that. Mm -hmm. in my opinion, the silver should have been just as big as the Jackson five. You know, they they were really. Well, it really... was. I'm glad you brought that up. But it was a, the problem was that was it. That was the problem right there. People were trying to compare them to the Jackson Five versus giving them their own merit, and so mm. it was just like. And then they wanted to, from what I saw, they wanted to transition from the bubblegum stuff that was hot for them, the stuff like Boogie Fever and Hotline, and the thing, and the thing that didn't help them any was the guy that wrote some of their biggest hits was the same guy that one of the same guys that produced the Jackson five got him Freddie parent. Mm. So that didn't help their cause to separate the camps because boogie fever was written by co-written by uh, or written by Freddie parent hotline was written by uh, Freddie parent. And there's a couple other songs that were big for them that he had his hand in. So, but the sound was different because the silvers were singing like barbershop harmonies because it was more of them. And it was a different mm. sound. Mm. And then you, and then, okay, see, that's the thing that you, you, again, there was this, and then there was the whole thing about disco and the time period and different parts of, of different things. And then you had Leon who was writing up some stuff. And it was funny, Leon, Leon does not get enough props as both a producer and a songwriter. I mean, yeah. and I'm not, it's like, even if you take the silver stuff out of the equation, I mean, he's written for the whispers. He's written for Dynasty. He's written for, you know, a bunch of different groups. And it's just like, ooh, you know, stuff mm. like And the Beat Goes On, stuff like, um, and he's also written and produced Lakeside. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you you have so many different textures of what he does from a funk standpoint. It's like, oh, this guy's a beast. 
And yeah, so, so that yeah. was part of, yeah. Yeah. Getting, yeah, getting but back I to agree, the, totally. Yeah, getting back to the jazz and hip hop, you know, you think about the roots and their influence and, you know, how, oh, yeah. how they. The roots, and, but see, the roots basically, in my opinion, they basically took what they were doing in early hip hop and, Basically, the roots, in my opinion, were was basically early hip hop on steroids. I mean, they but they think about it is they I mean they wrote their stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they would sample themselves. They would sample different parts of stuff, but they made it work. And it's like it's kind of similar to what Raphael Sadiq was doing, where he would borrow melodies from different stuff and write around it. Right with the and, uh, like, Lucy you know, stuff Pearl. Like stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but he it was but the roots was just were were and are just ridiculous i mean and one of the songs i think that some people are sick of it and are probably got sick of it quickly but that that co collaboration they did with uh cody chestnut was ridiculous the scene oh, oh I yeah love that i yeah. love what they do i love the next movement um oh yeah yeah they were just so hard it's just like, hey. yeah dude yes hey. yeah but that's the thing about the improvisation form of it. That's the, the, the thing that comes from the jazz, in my opinion, with them is, you know, they, they, you know, they make up different stuff and flip it. So, exactly. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, dude, man, uh, this has been great. We, we covered a lot with uh, 45 minutes. I got to go to work. But, yeah. you know, there's a reason why I asked you to do this, because I know you have a lot of deep knowledge. You know what I mean? We could kind of go that's, over, that's, yeah, you know. And, Genres. Thank you. To make a short story shorter, to make a short story shorter, this isn't just a hobby for me. It's right. What it's after a certain point, I realized this is who I was, and it's always cool for me, the people, for people to recognize it, and it's also cool for people to want to share it. Definitely, you know? man. So thank you for having me. Man. I really appreciate that. Because again, uh, it, it's cool for me to, to 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 again, like I tell people about my drumming and anything else, it's not mine. So why am I going to hog it? <laughs> share it with people that's the whole part of you get in the first place yeah and so. it's, it's an education someone can listen to this and be like hey i didn't know that you know it, it's all about right. education and you know and um and being limitless right why why can't you listen to primus and listen to the jackson five <laughs> after the one after another why can't you well, you know be into well, slayer and run about, dmt yeah. that part it, it, right. there, there are no, I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because there's a guy that I'm good friends with named Brent Spooner. His brother came over our apartment. So we were, we were roommates at one point. And uh, he lo was looking through my CD collection. He's like, your roommate listens to a lot of different stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I wasn't home and I just found it kind of comical. But that wasn't, that wasn't as funny as this will probably, I'll probably end on this. Someone who shall remain nameless asked me to come to a toaster show. And I'm like, well, I don't know their material. So... I'm not really interested. And she had the audacity to look my straight in the face and say, you need to open up your mind to more kinds of music. <laughs> and I just sat there and I, 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 right. It's like, think, think about, take that in for a second. Think short and hard about that. Considering who, what she said, and who she said it to. I'm talking to and you. I'm like, sweetheart, if you ever look, right. <laughs> and I said, if you ever were to look through my CD collection, your head would hurt from the diversity. Don't play with me. But, you know, at the it's end of the day, we, do. we we don't know everything at the end of the day, bro. We, we you know, we learn no, stuff. No, we don't. We don't know everything. Right. That's the whole point about this, this, this thing of life is it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing journey. It is. It is, bro. So you have a good day, you, you man. Know what I, you realize that you're, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm say this real quick and then we can get, but sure, I tell sure. people all the time, the second you think you're too old, you're too old to learn anything or you're like, you don't think you can learn anything else. That's the day you need to stop doing anything. Absolutely. Musically, I'll never come to that day, ever. Oh. And so, really, we should have a part two to this because there's a lot more that we didn't cover. You know, this. I know you know a lot I about rock, hard give, rock. Give me the word, man. More than know, happy to. Metal. I would alone. love to do this again. You know, there's a lot of metal oh, stuff yeah. we didn't talk about. You know, you know, I'm a huge metalhead, so it's like. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. See, but you, and that's the thing about with with a lot of the guys that I hang out with or some of the guys that I have as reference points. There's a guy I went to high school with, mm -hmm. and he's like my, there's a two couple guys. One guy named Eric Atwell, who's known as uh, DJ Cool Breeze, and another guy named Dam Damian Eaton, who I went to high school with. Uh -huh. And 
they're like my my hip hop eyes and my hip hop knowledge people. When I want to know about styles, I want to know about beats. I want to know mm -hmm. about different things like that. I pull both of them up. Mm -hmm. So it's for me, it's like going to people that know stuff more, more stuff about things that I don't know about and asking questions. So yeah. Sure. But dude, Definitely. part two, well, I'm ready when you are. Okay, man, I'll hit you up, man. I appreciate you, man. You have a good day. Thank you. I appreciate you too. Love you, bro. Take care of yourself, man. You too.